Good morning. This is Larger Wi-Fi Digital Exams. I'm Charles Clare. And there's assumed knowledge from this talk, and that was the talk I did last year, because I won't be going any, over any of that stuff, but if you need to see that talk to understand some of this stuff. So what was achieved last year? The university delivered over 34,000 digital exams in semester one, and they delivered over 39,000 digital exams in semester two. And this year they want to go even bigger. They want to go for 3,000 digital seats, but that's really going to depend if we get the five gig take up. Oh, sorry, the six gig take up. So why do they want more single building digital capacity? The main one is cost. They save a lot of money in proctoring when they do it all in one building. And the other one is they can run really big single subject exams, so they only need to do one, one exam. Previously, we'd run out of five gig spectrum. So this year, we needed to use six gig. Last year, we broke the exams up to either end of the hall to try and keep them apart, but that wasn't going to happen this year because we had to bring them closer and closer together. So how do you add more capacity? This year, we added directional antennas, the 9166D1s, and we also went to six gig. So in Australia, we get 25 gig, 25 uh, channels in 6 gig. We also, because we went from CAT OS to Air OS to CAT OS, we got an extra 5 gig channel. Now we still can't use channel 144 with Cisco, even though it's supported in Australia, but what's really weird is that the 9166D1s in Meraki mode do support it. <laughs> Last year I mapped out the coverage of these particular access points. But what was really counterintuitive is all the data was saying that we needed to have 11 dBm power, which seems silly because we're now directing all the power into one location, where when we were using Omnis, it was saying 10 dB. So why was the power more when we're directing the power? So I went against this judgment and put all the powers at 8 dBm. This was the design. There were 65 access points all throughout the hall. And we, this time, east and west were getting closer and closer to each other. This was what it looked like in simulation. And this is what it looked like in real life. Now, this is a heritage building. We can't put a single screw in the wall. So everything was made to come down very, very quickly and to do no damage to the building. We made special aluminium brackets that would go round the posts. And we used pool, pool noodles to stop it scratching the paint. This year, we ran continuary wires from the APs to the APs so that we could get the Cat5 cables upstairs and keeping the length to a minimum. We also trialled something new, and we found this six um, core 6E cable where we could run a, a reel which had six Cat5E cables within it, and it broke it out along the length. But fibres are the big thing that get broken especially when you've got thousands of people putting stuff in, especially at bump in. So this year we went above and beyond to make sure that fibre didn't get broken. This was mission control. And it was this little spot in the middle where we could hear both ends of the, the hall. I found a five metre active USB-C cable that worked with the Echo House, so we put a sidekick at the either side of this partition so that we could hear both ends of the hall. This year we simplified the power. Last year it was extension cords and power leads, but this year we got a custom cable made with outlets just at the right length. And as you can see, it looks much, much neater. So was more testing required? Had we changed much? Well, we basically changed everything. We had new coverage patterns, six gig, WPA3, more channels. We've got this extra channel. We're going from Air OS to Cat OS. And we had to go to a DNAC release that wasn't GD just to support these APs. Again, we didn't use RRM, but, we, but don't blindly trust your vendor's optimum channel plans. These are the settings that we put in for the RRM, uh, for the um, optimization of the channels, not using channel 144 because it's not supported, and also not using channel 149 because um, when you've got a room full of Macs, that channel is unusable. And this is what was produced. But we got these weird anomalies where it would put two channels right next to each other. Eventually, we did get an optimum channel plan, and that's what we used to, to, to map out the channels 
in the hall. Now, we had to get this into Cisco, and we, I now know why Cisco say always use RRM, because it's a real pain to set their channels and power levels. With Cisco, you, you need to use a power level. You can't put it in DBM, and it changes depending on the band. So depending, you had to then decide what level you wanted, and of course, you couldn't actually get the actual power level the same on every band. So I wrote a special macro where I could put in the channels and it would automatically generate the code that was needed. So these 14 lines of code was what was needed to set the channel and power for every AP. But we did the survey and using Adrian's tool, we, we were really happy to see that all of the PS, non-PSC channels were being advertised well. But the power levels didn't look good. Overall, they were very low. And also, we were looking at, well, even when you're under the AP, we were getting about minus 68. So I should have gone with what my testing said and run 11 dB. So luckily, I'd written that macro and we were able to push out the configuration. And there is a really nice little visualization in DNAC where you can show it in power and DBM so you can check that your macro actually worked. And then we did the survey in two products and it looked really, really good. We did have an issue in the first semester exams where Ekehau wouldn't show the non-PSC channels, but that bug was fixed and in, in semester two, it worked really well. Now there is a really nice thing in Tonic, um, and it's now called the Meta App, where it can show you what's being advertised on five gig in terms of the r, &R records for six gig. And I did find this really nice tool in the on-site app where you can walk around and see the primary and secondary se signal strength at a glance. And when the AP roams, the channel number changes in the circle. Now, we did have half an hour before the end of the exam, so I wanted to see, could RRM really do a good job? So I let it run for f at a five minute updates for 30 minutes. On five gig, it decided to move all of the APs onto that channel that we weren't using, channel 149. So that wasn't gonna be good. Six gig was interesting too. It decided straight away to move things to 80 megahertz wide channels. It realized that wasn't a good idea and then moved them back to 20 megahertz wide and then moved them all to PSC channels. Even though we had PSC enforcement set to disabled. The, um, we've since found you have to use that command in the bottom right hand corner to tell it not to bias the PSC channels. All the fleet laptops this year were Windows 11 and the, we set the driver to prefer six gigahertz. We had a large pool of machines. We had 300, and on average, 15% of the machines were swapped out during an exam. But having these, these uh, laptops was great because we could do performance testings. We had a couple of hours before the first exam, and we used them to run some performance testing to make sure everything was going to work. But this is an exam. You need a 100% success rate. I've never been in a, in a, in a, with a problem where you need a 100% success rate. You can't have one student's exam not work. The main thing is, if you have any issues, you swap out the device. There is no time to try and debug or sort out any issues. But we found that no tool did everything, and we found that it was very hard now to, to monitor 2.4 and 5 gig and 6 gig at the same time. So we needed to go stereo. So we had one copy of the software running 5 gig and another copy running 6 gig. And that way, we could monitor it all at the same time. But our go-to product was still Tonic or the Meta app, where if we had a rogue device that was chewing up all the airtime, we could catch it in a, in a second by looking at the size of the sections on the graph, and we could get the MAC address and swap the device out. And bags were becoming more of a problem as well. Students now went from one device to two devices in their bags. So we had to put some extra APs in the foyer so that all the devices that they leave on during the exam didn't connect to the exam infrastructure. Mobile phones this year weren't as big a problem as they were last year. Previously, we'd had two-factor authentication, and we told students as they entered the exam they had to turn their Wi-Fi off. This was quite hard to do. This year, we made it so that you didn't require two-factor if you were in the exam venue. So the messaging was very simple. It was all devices off. But the problem is a lot of students don't know how to turn their device off. I was amazed at how many students had no idea how to turn their iPhone off. A side effect of this was we caught all the hotspots. If a student put up their hand and said, I need my phone for authentication, we knew they were running their laptop off their hotspot because a lot of them are paired from their Macs to their phones. And even though they thought they were off, they're on under their desk. 
We did have some problems when we went to Cat OS. Last year, we were using the load balancing, and we were, were allowing for one kick, but we found that that didn't work in Cat OS, and we've since found that it never worked. And they say that it's fixed in 17.12.4, but our testing shows that it still isn't working. We also had to increase the idle time before removing an AP from a client because we were finding clients were getting disconnected during reading time. We also went from Prime to be fully reliant on DNAC. DNAC is very slow. It can take up to 15 minutes before you get the statistics, and that's an eternity when you're running an exam. But all the clients were getting great RSSIs, and we were still seeing very large peaks at the start of the exams when users' devices connected first, and they were syncing their OneDrives and Google Drives. But over the week, they just looked like little blips. And down the bottom there, which is one of the bigger exams, which is 2,000 clients, you can see all the devices from the previous exam timing out, the new students coming in, the exam starting, all the phones that were supposed to be off were turned off, they timed out, and then the exam ran, and all the clients were getting 10 out of 10 client scores. And lastly, we kept statistics on who, the, the support of 6 gig. Every exam, we worked out how many people were connected. We found all of our fleet devices connected at 6 gig, but we still found 5% of students' devices, even though they were 6 gig capable, still connected at 5 gig. So overall, we were seeing 20% um, Wi-Fi 6 devices. And we were also getting 98% clients connected with WPA3, which was great. Thank you. <laughs>